This is Jack Foley. Today's show is a rebroadcast of the second half of an interview I did with Lawrence Ferlinghetti on April 21st, 1994, almost 30 years ago. The interview took place at City Lights, and in it, Ferlinghetti candidly discusses his entire career. These shows are being done for Poetry Month and also in celebration of KPFA's 75th anniversary. The interview begins with Lawrence reciting a poem he wrote in French. L'occupation obsédée for Jacques Prévert. Assis sur la terrasse, Cap et Saint-Séverin, j'entends des voix allemandes de chaque côté et la voix américaine, le latin de nos jours, avec son empire qui roule toujours. C'est toujours Normandie, 1944, avec ses voix américaines et ses voix allemandes, suis toujours en train de débarquer. Je lis toujours le canard enchaîné. Je lis Libération toujours. Je vois encore l'oiseau délabré. J'entends encore la voix criante la voix palpitante de l'accordéon dans le métro l'hiver 1944 où je sens encore les, ga les gauloises jaunes suis toujours occupé occupé des rêves pensées qui me disent que la vie toujours est noble et tragique et les barques d'amour toujours se brisent sur les côtes de la vie de tous les jours, de la vie hebdomadarienne, du monde hebdomadaire, où je lis encore qu'il y a toujours la résistance qu'on voit contrôler, bien sûr, oui, la résistance toujours contre l'état monstre, contre les chaînes sur l'oiseau. Ah, Lost Gardens, Forgotten Fountains, tournesol détourné, cannabis caché, l'herbe sinsemilia, sinsemilia, oiseau frappé, bouche bouclée. <laughs> Beautiful. I notice we won't, we won't translate it, but for those of the uh, the listeners who notice cannabis cache, uh, <laughs> they will know what that is. Uh, it's a beautiful poem, and it's written back, uh, in a way, to Jacques Prévert. Sweet uh, toujours en train de débarquer. You did indeed. Uh, you were part of the Normandy invasion. Yes, and the débarquer has a it's a play on words here because débarquer is also a parigo, uh, that is Parisian slang for to come. Oh, indeed, all right, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> 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 but it, it, there's a lot of this. <laughs> there's a lot of steals from Jacques Prévert in this poem because, for instance, this uh, forgotten, this uh, Old Lost Gardens Forgotten Fountains, that's from his poem, which ends uh, with the word fraternity. fraternity. Yeah. The, um, actually, this, uh, your tentative, t uh, a poem I was surprised not to find in These Are My Rivers, tentative description of a dinner to impeach President Eisenhower, um, was uh, also, a, a the title was a translation of a title of Jacques Prévert's also, and, and there's a lot of Prévert right. that's, that's slipped in. description of a dinner of heads in Paris, France. That's it, yes, which, a, a poem of his which you didn't translate, well, actually. It's too hard to translate. There's too many plays on words which you couldn't get across into the French, into well, the English. Also, the, um, uh, though you rhyme the translations in a very interesting way, and, and there's probably more, there's as much rhyme in this as there is in many of your poems, maybe a little bit more, uh, but Prévert, some of Prévert's poems are sort of known for their rhyme. Uh, one thinks of uh, 
Rappel-toi, Barbara, il pleuvait sans cesse sur ce jour-là, you know, etc. And so that was a, not all of that comes into the English. English, as you mentioned at a certain point, we keep forgetting that English is not a romance language. Yeah, no. <laughs> and <That's> uh, right. <laughs> and uh, so that, that is part of it. But it's really interesting what you did with uh, Prévert. I think there are certain poems of yours. Well, now this poem, uh, the L'Occupation of the CD, that I just read, I don't know. Um, I've been studying Italian. I think it's affected my French accent. <laughs> my French friend Jean-Jacques Lebel always said I spoke uh, broken down Parigo. <laughs> Parigo is, uh, that was a compliment as far as I was concerned. But I think I have a pretty weird accent in French now. Um, since I've been studying Italian heavily for a number of years now, I, I've gotten to dislike the French language in a way. It seems so petty and introverted compared to the Italian. Huh. The Italian language is very outgoing and uh, expansive. Absolutely, and, and yeah. more fun to talk. You speak it with your body. And the Italians <laughs> aren't so particular about... Uh, the, the French are so snooty about their language. Uh -huh. um, if you make the slightest mistake, I remember I had to do my uh, defense of my doctoral thesis at the Sorbonne in French before this jury of professors who spoke, they made these florid introductions <laughs> to my thesis before I was allowed to speak, and uh, they spoke with beautiful uh, Académie Française French. And <laughs> yeah. I was scared to death I was going to make a mistake. I was more worried about making a mistake in speaking the French than in defending the actual points in the thesis. What was the thesis on? No, well, I always said it was uh, on the history of the peace wire in French <laughs> literature. <laughs> and that was taken seriously, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, a French professor who was actually a professor at the Sorbonne came, to the, came over here and interviewed me in, in the late 50s, I believe it was, the early 60s, and asked me what my thesis at the Sorbonne was, and I told him it was the history of the peace wire in French literature. And he could have looked it up in the library at the Sorbonne right. and gotten the real thing. Yeah, that's right. But he, he wrote it up and it came out in his book. <laughs> Years later, he found out. Of course, he was furious. <laughs> and what was it really? It was the city as a symbol in modern poetry. Yes, indeed. Uh, which is an interesting thesis for a man like yeah, you. French, uh, mostly French and English, uh, Actually, American poetry. I wanted to steer us towards the early poems, but maybe because you've been talking just a little bit about Italian, and you don't really have a poem in Italian. I was always interested in, in autobiography, how you managed to get in, in the very beginning of the poem, um, references to Italy, France, and then America, uh, all of your, uh, you know, your, 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 your places of birth, really. I'm leading a quiet life in Mike's place every day, watching the champs of the Dante billiard parlor and the French pinball addicts. I'm leading a quiet life on Lower East Broadway. I am an American. Uh, and uh, you get it all in. But I was wondering if we might read another really wonderful poem, a late poem, and it's in, again, we're reading from These Are My Rivers, which is from New Directions, Lawrence Ferlinghetti's New and Selected Poems, a very strong book. Uh, I was a little apprehensive in beginning to read it because I had read Endless Life, which I liked very much, which was his previous, oh, 10, 11 years ago, uh, selected poems. And I thought, well, you know, you do a selected poems, and uh, uh, what are you going to do for a second selected poems? Because, you know, a lot of the same material. But um, this is, in many ways, I think, a stronger book. Yes. And, and, um, it's a different selection. It's a different selection, and also it has the very strong European poems, of which we've been reading a few. Um, how about The Mouth of Truth? Piazza Bocca della Verità, oh, yeah. <laughs> 278. Uh, yeah. I have written some poems in Italian uh, lately, actually. Oh, do you? And I, you know, another thing about languages in general, I, 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 I spoke quite a bit of Spanish mm -hmm. until I started studying Italian heavily about seven years ago. And it went. And it really wiped out my Spanish completely. It was too close. I mean, one of your famous phrases actually is sueño real. Uh, that, oh, yeah. that, yes, that, that not life is a dream, but life is a dream real, a real dream or a royal dream. La vida es sueño real. Yeah. But that's a. I noticed I just did a French R. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> yeah, right. The, the, that comes from Car Calderon de la Barca, who had a play called uh, La Vida es Sueño. Uh, wasn't it Lope de Vega? Am I mistaken? Uh, I don't think so. I think it was Calderon de la Barca. Uh, you, may, you may well be right. I thought it was uh, Lope de Vega. Uh, so he, I, he said, la vida, la vida es Sueño. I added real, which could mean life is a real dream or life is a royal dream. Yes. 
the splendid life of the world. Actually, the word life shows up often in this book, These Are My Rivers. Uh, in another beautiful poem we may not have time for, but a poem about Segovia's music. Often in this book, the voice of life speaks through music. And that's a long poem. Beautiful. Uh, and, but, but often, it's not the only poem in which music, this assassination raga, also in some others, in which music speaks the kind of heart of life. Assassination raga we did with a sitar or a sarod in the background, and it was very effective. It's on an old fantasy record, and I think it was reissued in the CD that fantasy put out recently called Howl's Rips and Roars, and they reproduced the old poetry and jazz of the cellar, and yes. I think they also did that assassination raga with the... I'm not sure that's on it. Maybe it is. I'm not sure. Uh, it may be. It may be. There are, there are some things on it. I read this, uh, Mouth, Mouth of, of Truth. Truth. Yes. This is in the Italian section. Mm -hmm. um, it's not one of the Canti Romani. It's funny. The Canti is a supposedly songs and cantos, uh, Ezra Pound's cantos, that's one thing they aren't. They aren't. They couldn't possibly be sung. <laughs> <laughs> Some of your canti can be sung, though. Well, might be, but anyway, this is the mouth of truth, which is, I, I always say a poem is a failure if it has to be explained, so I think everything is inside this poem that needs to, <laughs> we used to go to these readings where, uh, this is like before how it was published, you get this 10-minute introduction of a two-minute poem. <laughs> right, yes. And you completely shoot it down before the guy even, before he even read it. And usually the, po the poem's introduction is more interesting than the poem. Right, right. that's quite <laughs> the <old> case. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> the mouth of truth. Is this the mouth of truth in the, in the face of this woman walking across the piazza Boca de la Verita? where the great round stone is set up in the portico of the church of Santa Maria in Cosmedin. Her little feet taking her past the temple of the virgins, past the temple of the phallus, and past the street of the misericordia. She has not been kneeling in any church. She trots along on her two high heels. She has smart rhinestone glasses and silk pants, very well cut. She has a sweet face, spoiled by lipstick, a botched attempt at something but the truth. She could be the daughter of a Shaw, but she isn't. She's some secretary, late at the office. The boss was beastly tonight. Her mouth must have answered. Those rouge lips could cope with any tongue. She's tough in a way, not so tough. She has her soft spots. Her lower lip is very sensitive. You can tell there are other soft places from that. She has her cigarette lip in her right hand, the same hand she may have put into the mouth of truth, that great round pagan stone at the mouth of the church, which will bite off her hand if you're hiding some lie. She did not put her head into the mouth of the lion. Her left hand has rings in the wrong places. She doesn't have a boyfriend this year, but she has her cigarette. You can tell it is a close friend, the way she fondles it. It is a filter tip. She is looking forward to lying down on her bed in the dark, in her slip with the window open. There is a tree outside in the morning, a bird. She is smoking her cigarette, her mouth of truth around the filter. She has filtered out all but the truth. The truth will come through. The truth will out. The mouth will open when she's asleep on her back by the open window, by the tree with its leaves like lips. The lower lip, so sensitive, will quiver. The throat utter some deep sound. The tongue, mute messenger, with its speechless truth. To whom will she tell it? In what dream? <laughs> In what dream, indeed. <laughs> the mouth of truth. Actually, as long as we're doing some uh, Italian here, I'm going to make a, a, a request, if I might, uh, which is Dove sta amore, uh, which is on page 100. And uh, Pound wrote Dove sta memoria, of course, in, in his, his uh, translation of Cavalcanti, and uh, he wrote, he wrote Dove sta memoria, where memory ra uh, lies, etc., in the middle of his uh, Cavalcanti translation, which also yeah. shows up in the uh, cantos. Yeah, Dove sta memoria is a famous line before I used it. <laughs> what this is, uh, means, uh, you know, where lies love. Yes. Dove sta amore? Dove sta amore? Where lies love? Dove sta amore? Here lies love. The ring dove love in lyrical delight. Here love's hill song, love's true will song, love's low plain song. 
too sweet pain song in passages of night. Do vista amore, here lies love. The ring dove love, do vista amore, here lies love. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, we can go to another kind of use of language, which is very interesting too, which is page 92, and it's very American. Say it was like this, when we waltz into this place, a couple of papish cats is doing an Aztec two-step, and I says, Dad, let's cut. But then this dame comes up behind me, see, and says, you and me could really exist. Wow, I says, only the next day, she has bad teeth and really hates poetry. <laughs> a terrible situation. Is, is this uh, a couple of papish cats in the Aztec? Really is my, this Mexico? My New York accent <laughs> comes back. In that poem. <laughs> yeah, very much. Um, what about, which is what we're doing here, too, I think, a, a signature poem of yours, really, um, which I opened the program with, Constantly Risking Absurdity, which is on page 96. These are such, it's really interesting to go through this book, um, These Are My Rivers, and refresh your memory which is very strong of these poems. These are poems that stay with you for a lot of reasons. Constantly risking absurdity and death. Whenever he performs above the heads of his audience, the poet, like an acrobat, climbs on rhyme to a high wire of his own making and balancing on high beams above a sea of faces, paces his way to the other side of day performing entre-shots and sleight-of-foot tricks and other high theatrics and all without mistaking anything for what it may not be. For he is a super-realist who must perforce perceive taught truth before the taking of each stance or step in his supposed advance toward that still higher perch where beauty stands and waits with gravity to start her death-defying leap and he, a little Charlie Chaplin man, who may or may not catch her fair eternal form, spread eagled in the empty air of existence. That's a beautiful poem, and it is a signature poem. It's interesting because um, there are a lot of things that are opened up, I think, as one goes through this book, and it's a very rich book. Uh, one of them is that um, your early poems, and again, they aren't that early. This is not really a young man's book. Um, you begin when you're 35, rather like Dante. In fact, uh, Dante had a few prose introductions to his poems in La Vida Nueva, which weren't so bad <laughs> as those things go. But um, these poems are all fairly short. Most of them are about a page long, maybe a little bit longer. And it's only later, as you get, it seems at any rate, as you get into uh, the specifically oral work, poems that you designate as, as oral poems done for jazz accompaniment, which you talk about in, in uh, um, Coney Island of the Mind, there's a section of what you'll call oral poems there. And they are longer. And you're beginning to write longer pieces than these shorter, very lyrical uh, pieces, which seemed very interesting. Was it partly through the experience of jazz well, the music? The lyrical ones were really still the French influence, and then the, yeah. the long ones were the ones that there were sent, came from living in San Francisco. And, uh, like I'm waiting, and, and yes, yeah. Mike's place, Mike's place. the street here, and uh, it's uh, just a... Uh, Was Ginsburg an influence on those things? Uh, no, not at all. I don't think Ginsburg's been any influence on me. Uh huh. You've described yourself as bohemian, but not beat. I mean, see, uh, I didn't even know the beat poets when they were starting out at Columbia University. Uh, Ginsburg, Kerouac, Burroughs, Corso. I, I never heard of them because I was living in a French family in France, working on a French doctorate, and I never didn't know any American poets. And it was only after. Uh, we started City Lights in 1953, and poets naturally congregate in bookstores that I started meeting the poets, getting the beat poets, and I uh, became associated with them by publishing them. Well, but these were poems that were written around that time, this longer poems. We had our poetry had any affinity. Uh -huh. For one thing, I, my poetry is completely different from what I call Alan's graph of consciousness. It's 
school of poetry. The graph of consciousness is like, the poem is a graph of consciousness of what went through the poet's mind at that particular sitting, or a session, uh, that particular uh, moment, and the poem may often have nothing for title except the date. I mean, Gary Snyder used to do this a lot, and Philip Whalen. Uh -huh. Quite often the poem, uh, the date uh, in Roman nobles will be uh, the title of the poem, and it'll be begin where the poet directly transcribed without as little interference as possible, directly what had gone through his mind at that moment, the unedited thought, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. first thought, best thought. That's right. And then the well, wouldn't want to say first book, best book either. <laughs> like it's quite often the poem could be called Take One. Yes, you know, yes, take yes. Two. Yeah, yeah. And it's what went through, that was the graph of consciousness of that moment. Well, I never had that conception of a poem. Like, I, for instance, that poem I just read constantly, The Whispering of Serbian and Death, there's this uh, completely balanced image of the central image of the poet as an acrobat. It's like a, a, a mobile twisting in air where you can see the whole image as a totality and it's not just a, well I shouldn't say just, it's not a graph of consciousness. Well it's actually one of the... It's an, it's an Im 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 quite a visual, most of my poems have a very strong visual basis. I was going to mention that actually that's what I was about to say, that one of the reasons one remembers these poems, one remembers certain lines too. I also yeah. have seen the yeah, spider. I was painting before I was writing in Paris. Mm -hmm. Before I ever got anything published, I was uh, I was spending more time painting than writing poetry. And there's a lot of visual uh, aspects to these to these poems, and also the play on the page, the way the lines move around is rather yeah, visual. It's another thing uh, uh, with, uh, for instance, uh, Charles Olson's poetry. Mm -hmm. There's a term used for his type of typography, um, uh, which is similar to mine. Projective uh, verse. That, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I forget the term that's used for the type of photography, uh, typography that's all over the page. Uh huh. I'm not sure about any anyway, print terms. I call it open form yes. typography. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, which is um, I have in mind uh, open form painting. Um, I sort of. Uh, find myself with the New York School of Non-Objective Painters, Klein, Mikuni, and Motherwell. What about the people out here? Contemporaries in New York, and uh, I was trying to paint like them, and my my poems were using that open form typography, where where the, the amount of silence or the amount of white space on the page in a poem amount of white space around a phrase would force the reader to leave that much silence, It'd indicate how much silence if the word is all by itself with a lot of white space around it. So it's Real dead is one yeah. phrase that you have that's like that. It's, mon it's terribly it forces, effective. It forces because the reader to read the poem yeah. the way you want it read. But the oral poems are not like that. No. The, uh, the longer poems are return to the left margin, and these remain, uh, a p this remains a kind of play in your work between the poems that move in that way, the way that you're describing around the page, and those that return to the left margin and tend to be a little longer. Uh, two of your most famous poems, the, uh, you know, the populist manifestos, are like that, where they return. They become more discursive. Yes, yes, yes. Also... Or they have an argument to... Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, um, one of the places I think where you do connect, not it's not aesthetically but philosophically, with the beats is this strong sense of the individual and of subjectivity, which is something I think that's very important in your work and also in their work too, um, and and that the individual is imaged in you so often. I mean, your bookstore is named for Charlie Chaplin's movie, uh, and uh, good heavens, there's so many in, uh, you know indications of Charlie Chaplin in your work, a uh, little Charlie Chaplin man, as you say there. And also, of course, Adieu at Ch a Charlot, which is beautiful. And you're using the French version of his name uh, for mm -hmm. the second popula uh, populist manifesto. Mm -hmm. um, that, I think, is a very important thing. Um, and what you say, we never quite got to the point when we were doing the Jacques Prévert, but what you say in the Jacques Prévert poem, the poem for Jacques Prévert, is uh, that uh, the resistance, which, of course, is a historical thing, and you're talking about the 40s and the Normandy invasion, so you're talking about the French resistance, yeah. but you say, oh no, resistance to the monstrous state, uh, l'état monstre, yeah. 
yeah. is an uh, eternal thing. This goes on all the time. It's going on yeah. now. And that it's not just that resistance in 1944. But yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and um, you, I mean, this is a sort of silly question in a way, but I, I feel obliged to ask you. Um, we've been talking about VFL and Getty, and you're about to be honored by the state in many ways. Um, uh, and you have been, of course. There have been other ways. You've also been arrested by the state, <laughs> etc. Um, what do you make of all this? Here you are. You've been a good anarchist. You've been a good rebel. Uh, you've spoken out. That poem of yours that we began with was one that was difficult to publish. And here's the state saying, let's honor him. What do you make of that? Well, but see, the state is with a small F in this case. It's yes. just the city government. And mostly one person, Angela Aliota. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I mean, after all, San Francisco, uh, many people never considered San Francisco as part of the United States anyway. <laughs> it was That's always right. considered an island. Uh, even the Indians who lived here before us had a myth of San Francisco as an island. Queen Calithia. Uh, part of San Francisco is uh, uh, drifting further from the main mainland USA every year, as we know from the San Andreas Fault. Um, Could you live elsewhere in the United States? Uh, well, Certainly not Waco, Texas. Not Bolinas, <laughs> which is uh, separating itself rapidly from the United States. <laughs> And one. And, uh, so th this is a, a general movement of the disintegration of uh, the great state in our time. I mean, first, the, well, uh, the Spanish Empire went, the French Empire went, and then the British Empire went, then the Russian Empire <laughs> went, and it may be our turn now. Pictures of the gone world. <laughs> the, the empire yeah. is uh, uh, something that... Uh, on the way out, I think, and in fact, nation states um, may not exist uh, for a hell of a lot longer. I, mean, I agree with you. I, I remember Gunter Grass told me when he came through San Francisco after living in India and he came through San Francisco going back to Germany about five years ago, he said that he thought the 21st century was going to see mass migrations around the face of the earth uh, in um, uh, hordes sweeping the earth in search of food and shelter mm. and uh, uh, nations as we know them will no longer exist and this is quite possible within the, the next hundred less, years so less than the next less than hundred years yeah, and I you see this happening already this mass migration Absolutely. Many of them come to San Francisco. In fact, there <laughs> outside City Lights, there was a couple taking a photograph. I'm going to have to cut here because our time is just about out. There's lots more to talk to Lawrence Ferlinghetti about. Lawrence, thank you so much for being my guest today. And uh, we'll be back with some more shows with, with, with Lawrence, I think, including Jack one Foley, on Jeremy Reed. Jack Foley is doing great things in articulating the poetic consciousness of San Francisco. Thank you so much. That was very kind. <laughs> thank you, Lawrence. And this is the current version of Jack Foley, some 30 years later. You've been listening to an interview I did with the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti. It was on April 21st, 1994, and it took place in Lawrence's office in City Lights Books. Thanks to Lawrence for doing such a wonderful interview with me. And this show has been a celebration of National Poetry Month, of course. It's April but also of KPFA's 75th birthday. Next week. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, KPFA. Happy birthday to you. Hi, this is Richard Walensky, host of Book Waves, Art Waves, airing Thursdays at 1 p.m., wishing KPFA a happy 75th birthday. You're listening to KPFA 94.1, KPFB 89.3 in Berkeley, and KFCF 88.1 in Fresno. KPFB in Berkeley. KPFA. 
Welcome to Cover to Cover. I'm your host, Nina Serrano. My guest today is Louise Moises, a graduate of San Jose State, was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, where she still resides. She's been a teacher, a storyteller, a puppeteer, and the owner of an antiquarian bookstore. She started writing poetry in 2017 as a means of dealing with grief. Her first chapbook, Peace is a Pelican, will be available in April from Finishing Line Press. Louise particularly enjoys performance poetry, and some of her featured readings are available on YouTube. Welcome, Louise Moises, to Literary Dialogues. I'm honored to be asked to read today and to be on uh, pr with my prestigious friend, Nina. Well, I'm really happy to be here with you, and I'm eager to hear your poetry today, as I always am. Oh, thank you. So what have you prepared for us today? I thought I would read one that's kind of a favorite of mine. It actually is inspired by a visit to BLM land outside of Delta, Utah, a very vast and open area with no paved roads. And it's where the wild horses graze. And the poem is entitled, Arroyos. In this parched Utah landscape, horses travel in arroyos on silent hoofs move towards water. A sturdy white mare guides her foal the rest of her herd follows through dry washes. They run towards the spring. I have hidden my love for you in a deep arroyo when I should have sent it running with the horses. At first, too cautious, too fearful of another loss. Before you came, my landscape parched and arid like the land of central Utah. You guided me towards sustaining springs. Together, we watched the horses drink, followed them as they disappeared into arroyos. They left only dust rising above the desert ditches. The sun vanished behind the rolling hills. The stars reflected in the spring. Somewhere beyond the arroyos, the horses hid in protective herds, slept standing up as horses do. While you and I lay beneath the midnight sky in the quiet arroyos of each other's arms, I dreamt of horses at the spring and yielded to the icy water. Lovely. What is an arroyo exactly? So arroyo is a, basically a desert ditch that's been uh, dug by repeated flash floods. So it, arroyo is a fast wash of water that washes away the bank and then the arroyo will be dry during most of the year until the monsoons come, creating these torrential rainstorms. Flash flood washes more pieces of the bank away and leaves this empty arroyo where the horses run through. It's a dangerous area. You have to be very careful not to be caught in an arroyo because it, you could easily be swept away by a flash flood. I don't often write in rhyme, but I thought I would bring one of the rhymed poems that kind of that I wrote really early on when I was widowed for a second time. And that's when I started writing poetry in a very direct way. And my first poems were 
about grief and loss. And I still go back to that subject kind of on a regular basis. But this is one of my few rhyming poems, Empty Chairs. I search for him and all the chairs, but every day he isn't there. The yellow dining chair bereft of shoulders broad, his chest, his neck. The wooden stool where once he sat perched upon the kitchen mat, he was there to prep a dish, peel a vegetable, bone a fish. And on the deck, the slatted chair, its arms all stiff with vacant air. No more a conversation shared. I cannot hear the voice that cared. The garden bench beside the wall where once he read in spring and fall, the cat now sleeps upon his place. I cannot see his smiling face. The office chair that does not roll, that creaked the floor and took its toll of difficult financial times, checks to write and poems to rhyme. The recliner sits in upright space, no feet to rest, no back to brace. The bedroom chair without his clothes. My mind in logic surely knows he'll not return to take a seat, but my heart with longing prays to meet the man that sat in all those chairs. Could he once more find comfort there? How beautiful. You know, even despite that it's rhyming, it's very sad, despite the rhyme. I've recently taken uh, a poetry class from the poet emeritus, uh, poet laureate emeritus of Emeryville, Sarah Kobrinsky. And for 30 days, she gave us a prompt every morning. And one of the prompts was to write a cento, which is a poem made up of lines from other poets. So I had a great time reading many, many poems. And I used 14 different poets in this cento. I used Dudley Randall, Sarah Teasdale, Alfred Lord Tennyson, Shelley, Ted Couser, Howard Nemiroff, William Collins, Robert Frost, Emily Dickinson, Edgar Allan Poe, Edna St. Vincent Millay, Kenneth Rexroth, and Robert Penn Warren. So the poem is Night Ascento. I saw night close down on earth like a great dark wing. The veils are drawn about the world. The drowsy lights along the paths are dimmed and pearled. Now sleeps the crimson petal, now the white. I arise from dreams of thee in the sweet sleep of night and moonbeams kiss the sea. Above us stars, Beneath us constellations, five billion miles away, a galaxy dies like a snowflake falling on water. All night, the cities like shimmering novas and spoke the speechless world and sang the towers of the city into the astonished sky. Now night, is hushed, save where the weak-eyed bat with short, shrill shriek and flits by on leathern wing. I have been acquainted with the night as all heaven were a bell. Through luminous windows saw spirits move musically. Under my head till morning but the rain is full of ghosts tonight that tap and sigh. Midnight breaks with driving clouds and plunging moon. 
rare, vast of endless stars in a dark time, the eye begins to see. Thank you to 14 amazing poets. Those were 14 amazing poets, beautiful poets, and read very, very expressively. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think a lot of people know that during the summer, I travel across the country to see my family and I drive my big old RV uh, on my own. So um, I wrote this poem about my travels and I write a lot as I'm on the road. I write a haiku every day and then I write about the different scenery that I see. The Arroyo poem actually originated when my husband and I used to travel together. And this particular poem just won an award at uh, the Aina Kubrit Circle. It's Congratulations. Thank you. Um, it's entitled A Night at the Rest Stop. In my 79th year, except for the companionship of my cat, I travel solo in my 23-foot RV, crisscrossing the country to visit family. In the passenger seat, the phantom of my husband who journeys on another plane. Each mile we converse, I describe the scenery, recall the days when he could answer. At dusk, I look for a place to spend the night. Tonight I'm in Kansas, a secure and spacious rest stop, surrounded by trees, populated by trucks, cars, and other motorhomes. On this heated night, I crawl into my narrow corner bed, draw only the sheet over my body. The hum of semi-generators lulls me to sleep, and I dream. A dream invaded by pounding, loud and insistent. Fully awake, I click on my phone. 1 a.m. The pounding continues. It's on my motorhome door. Traveling solo has its risks. Grady Cat stares at the vibrating door, his body tense, ears rotating. He dances from side to side, sniffing the air. I whisper to him, what should we do? What would my husband have done? I move to the window adjacent to the door. A woman looks up at me, stops pounding, mouths something. I cannot understand. Hearing aids on the charger. I shake my head in denial and lower the blinds. My heart pounds like the concussion on the door. I hold my breath. All is quiet, save for the diesel generators. I worry about the woman. I worry about my safety. I climb back in bed, stare at the light dancing on the ceiling as it seeps through the overhead vent. I invent various scenarios. Maybe she's a kidnap victim, lost, confused, hungry, alone. Or perhaps it's a trap trying to get someone to open a door. If she is truly in danger, there are other people, a parking area filled with vehicles. Mystery, unsolved, I toss and turn, ask my absent husband to hold me, protect me as he had promised. Gradually, I fall back to sleep. There is no more pounding. Well, I'm glad to see you made it through that night. <laughs> I never know what the adventure's going to be. I've had 
written a lot about my journey. I'm hoping that at some point I can gather it all together and put it into a, a chapbook that's devoted to the travel. Well, you have a chapbook coming out this April, Poetry Month. Very exciting. Yes, I am. Some of my pieces from that journey are in that, but sometimes they're beautiful things I see and sometimes not so beautiful. So I just never know. This one is um, about my dad. This one was published in a really interesting anthology called GI. And it was all about military life and people that either wrote poems or flash fiction about their experience in the military. And I saw a call for submissions and I thought about this memory I had of my father. My father flew in blimps. In World War II, my father flew in blimps, great gray whales of the air floating on a hum of small engines, dipping above the house where my mother lived before she was my mother or he, my father. She ran out under the porch, wildly waving in her innocence, believing he could hear her voice, throwing her love into the sky, where the bulbous navy blimp teetered above the house. Windy day, whoosh of wind, scrapes the caw-cawing crows across the baby blue blanket of a sky bends the branches in cracking ache, sets the chimes to clinking and tinkling, pushes open the creaking gate, launches the plastic garbage can bang banging against the house. Within, I sit at the computer, click clacking the keys, listening to nature's cacophony. Through the window, I watch the dance, Warblers wrangle a twitter twitter, woodpecker peck pecking on the lichen licked branches of the ancient tree. Across the street, Johanna dances, singing tra la la as the wind whizzes whipping in her chiffon skirt. She giggles and wiggles, pushing at the bellowing. Is that the poet, Johanna Ely, that you're referring to? You no, know it is not. It's a little girl who lives across the street, and I can see her from my office window. And I have written a couple of poems about her. And sometimes she's bouncing her ball against the wall, and she's kind of a lonely soul. But at this on this particular day, she was like out dancing with the wind, and everything was making noise. And I could hear her voice calling to the wind above the howl as it went by the house. How wonderful. You captured it. Thank you. I love to write from nature, and everything is kind of inspired by nature in a way. But this one's kind of a fun poem. Jackrabbit. In heated afternoon, Jackrabbit and I, the only ones on the trail, his majestic ears spoil an effort at camouflage. He senses my presence, stands perfectly still, unblinking in harmony with brambles, a totem of the high desert. Around a scent of dry summer grasses, pungent aroma of sun-baked sage, an incense benediction in this tabernacle of southwestern landscape. Unseen song, sparrow trills, clear pleasing notes, light and slightly husky. Soloist at the altar, no need of a choir. A lizard so thin, I almost missed him rests in the shadow of a boulder. I lean on my walking stick, wipe 
the sweat from my forehead, sip from my water bottle, linger, unwilling to break the spell. I take a few cautious steps, keep an eye on the rabbit. I could stand here for hours, maybe even days. Yet I know, in this life, there is only moving forward. Oh, that's wonderful. There's only moving forward, and you have certainly done that. Do you have a few more for us? Would you like a concluding poem? Or do you need one in between? Uh, I'll take in between. One in between. Okay, let's see. <coughs> a lizard's trek. A lizard, the color of kaibab sandstone, skips and scampers across an array of Navajo blankets, displaying a rainbow of native crafts meant to tempt the browsing tourist. The lone lizard roams over tightly woven baskets, mounting and descending a row of silver necklaces, burning his feet on the sun-warmed amulets of hematite. Its blade toes race across a tangle of turquoise bracelets. Around the curvature of a hand-coiled pot etched with images of corn maidens. He mounts a soapstone sculpture of an iguana, matching reptile for reptile. From his perch, he stares down at his prey, a singular leggy, lean red ant who stops and waits just out of reach, knowing somehow the length of the lizard's sticky tongue. Like a magic stage magician, the ant vanishes down a hole, too small for the lizard's girth. The lizard performs a disappointment dance, swaying from side to side, executing four fine push-ups, then scurrying for safety in camouflage. Beneath an overhanging rock, the lizard watches as the bronze-skinned Navajo offers a bracelet to a pale woman with soft round arms. Money and smiles are exchanged. Neither Navajo nor woman are aware that a lizard stepped upon the bracelet, leaving sacred hidden messages with his toes. Oh, I like that, hidden messages. I actually saw a lizard running across the Navajo blanket and all these artifacts. And I thought, there is a poem there. And it there certainly was. Yeah, it took me a lot of revision. And um, it won a, a prize at uh, the Artist Embassy Inter International a few years ago. Uh, so do you do a lot of rewriting? I do. I do. I work a lot on revision and I enjoy revision. Um, I belong to several critique groups and uh, one meets twice a month on Zoom and we bring, there's six of us in the group, we each bring a poem and we do it in three kind of phases. The first phase, people say what they really liked about the poem, lines that they particularly liked or the style or whatever. And then the second, the poet asks questions of the critique group about the poem. And then third, the, the poet asks for whatever critique might be helpful in uh, polishing the poem. And uh, I, I really enjoy my group and I learn from critiquing other people's poems as well as them critiquing mine. You know, I read in um, a book on poetry by Mary Oliver that sometimes she would revise a poem 50 times and I weary at about three or four. So yes, <laughs> yes. So you have a final poem for us. Okay, so I'm going to read the final poem, which um, is 
part of uh, the line from it is a uh, piece is a pelican, which is the title of my chapbook. So this is the final poem in my chapbook. Peace is. Peace is a sunset seen through a veil of fog, lacy waves lapping sandy shore, alone with the tide, salty fragrance of the sea, listening to the mantra of crash and recede, crash and recede on into infinity. Peace is a pelican framed against an aqua sky, soaring along the shore, unaware of wars, winging above waves, a prehistoric vision, would that I could fly on the wings of a pelican. Peace is the discovery of an ancient oak, gnarled, bent, enduring, an elder with stories to tell. Listen, snap of twigs, crack of branches, rustle of grasses around the depths of roots, a history. Peace is a small girl on a big horse, rounding a barrel in a dusty rodeo arena, a crowd of friends, family, and perfect strangers, all cheering a unity of the moment, the many as one. Peace is being alone with a waterfall, chill splash of rushing, roaring water, fragrance of pine, swoop of swallows singing, standing beneath a cascading curtain of water. Peace is a birth of monarchs, from cracked chrysalises, wet stained glass wings, struggling to open and close, thin black legs clinging to feathery fronds of milkweed. Peace is a prayer whispered in shadows, a large clanging bell, angle of ceiling, scent of incense, flicker of candles, Peace is finding a church within your heart. Peace is a solitary figure in a high desert landscape, scent of heated sage, sky as large as it can ever be, a rocky line where earth meets clouds, then a simple gesture, a wave of love. Oh, how lovely, a wave of love. Beautiful, a perfect place for us to end. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. It was my great pleasure. drives at KPFA are not just a request for your financial support. It's a call to action to ensure that 94.1 FM remains a beacon of hope, enlightenment, and activism. Your donation, no matter the size, is a vote of confidence in the power of independent, listener-supported radio. It's a declaration that you stand with us in our mission to inform, inspire, and incite change. Thanks again for your generous support, and keep listening to KPFA. 
You're listening to 94.1 KPFA Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB Berkeley, and 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR Santa Cruz, 94.3 K232FC in Monterey, and always online at kpfa.org.